Okay. okay, guys, uh, I think let's get started. Uh, so today, Sean Miller is going to talk about the quantum case from the secret report view, uh, which is part of the project that we are working on, uh, less reduction. Thank you. All right, thanks for that introduction. And um, yeah, so we're going to be discussing a little bit about uh, just the introduction to quantum <coughs> computation. So we'll talk a little bit about qubits, quantum gates, and eventually I'll discuss how this, uh, maybe how quantum computation affects the NIST security requirements. Um, so if you were on my preliminary exam, this last section is going to seem very familiar. Uh, however, hopefully it'll still be something um, useful out of the talk. I, I switched it up a little bit because um, I initially wanted to eventually implement a while loop using quantum computation, but that ended up being a little more involved for this talk, so I think it uh, will be nice to actually talk about some of the NIST security requirements, especially because there's a lot of people from our coffee group here as well. So I just want to start with a kind of ugly table. There's really only one column, I have two columns I want you to focus on. That's the name of the scheme and the claimed uh, security level. You'll notice that there's a section for uh, quantum. So as you probably all know, um, RSA and uh, elliptic curve uh, different element can be broken by a quantum computer. Um, that's why, well, there's blanks here. They are not secure against quantum computer. These numbers are a little outdated, but I just like the setup here to get to see a little bit of um, all these different crypto systems that are affected by an adversary with a quantum computer. Uh, we have SIDH here as well. That one uses a, um, that is a super singular isogeny, not a lattice problems. Throughout uh, the later portion of the talk, I'm going to focus on two schemes in particular that are uh, lattice-based schemes. Um, that's my field I study, and so I figured that would be probably a good one to work with. Um, so we will actually be testing out some of the security of uh, New Hope and Frodo. I'll show you how we actually arrive at the security parameters for uh, quantum adversaries. A lot of the time, we don't just look at the computational time it will take uh, for an adversary. We also look at the uh, resources they might need. And it's no different when we're looking at a adversary that has access to a quantum computer. So it's very useful to get down at a level where we're actually considering the logic gates you use, as well as the uh, qubits used in um, solving or uh, cracking one of these encryption schemes. I'll start with just a description of a qubit. Um, so we're all used to seeing classical uh, bits. So it's either going to be a 0 or a 1. Uh, a qubit is allowed to be somewhere in the middle between two. We say that it is in uh, superposition between the uh, on and off stage, so in between 0 and 1. Because we're mostly mathematicians here, I'm all a computer scientist, I'm not going to get into the physics. I don't think there's anything from dynamical systems, so that's okay. I'll use just a, a linear algebra point of view when discussing uh, quantum mechanics. Um, so a qubit can then be modeled by a two-dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, we have the basis vectors. Uh, I'm just going to call them, this is Brockett notation or Dirac not notation. I'm just going to associate them with two-dimensional vectors. So the uh, um, zero state is going to be one zero and the one state is just going to be 0, 1. Um, you don't have to use these as your bases as long as you have uh, two basis elements that are orthogonal and normalized, you can use them as your uh, basis for um, your Hilbert space. Okay. So to represent a qubit in superposition, um, I'm just uh, representing it as a linear combination of just the two basis states, 0 and 1. Uh, here, the alpha and beta, the coefficients, are from complex numbers. But for this talk, it suffices just to think of them as real numbers. So these two will be, in our cases, we're not going to be considering imaginary numbers. Okay. And as you might have 
occurred, uh, we're not able to actually uh, watch this human pass through all these gates, and we don't know the result until we actually measure the qubit. Uh, and to do that, there's all this physics we need to worry about, but in this case, we're just going to worry about the coefficients to determine the probability if it's going to be measured as a zero or a one. So given a particular qubit, and we're going to measure this uh, psi state, there is a probability of that alpha squared that will be measured as a zero bit, and a probability of beta squared that will be measured as the one bit. So naturally, probabilities all need to add up to one. Um, so that's why we actually require these uh, bits in superposition to be normalized. Um, so that psi that's going to be represented as alpha beta must be uh, normalized to one. So a quick example of a qubit in superposition. Um, this is the plus state. Uh, it's one that appears quite often. You can use this as a basis vector uh, along with the minus state when it's just, instead of a plus here, it's just a minus. So in this particular instance, our alpha and beta are both 1 over square root of 2. So in this particular instance, we have uh, probability 1 half to measure this quantum state as a 0 and half to measure it as a, uh, a 1. And I particularly wanted to point out this little purple gate here. This is uh, what is known as a Hadamar gate. We will discuss gates in the next slide. Uh, but it's a tool that we have at our disposal. If we have a quantum computer, we can set a bit in, or a qubit into superposition, which is exactly what I'm doing here to obtain this uh, plus bit. Uh, this one zero, remember that was our uh, zero bit. I'm applying a logic gate, as I call it, a Hadamar gate, to put this into superposition. So gates are really our way of uh, manipulating um, quantum information. As said here. Uh, in this talk, we'll be mainly concerned with acting, uh, with logic gates acting on a single qubit. Um, so we're just going to keep our uh, two-dimensional representations of our qubits. And our gates are going to be uh, two by two matrices. And we do require that our gates uh, be reversible. This is different from uh, classical computing. We'll get to an example in a bit. Uh, um, but for now, uh, let's consider some quantum gates. Okay, like I said, these all act on one single qubit, so they're just going to be uh, two by two matrices. We got a little taste of the uh, Hadamard gate, this is called. This is how we put a bit into uh, superposition when it starts at the zero state. This is a poly Z and X uh, matrices, uh, um, gates. You might recognize this as the, uh, it's equivalent to the classical not gate. It will turn the bit zero into a bit one and bit one into a bit zero. The Z here, it's, uh, it doesn't do anything to the bits. Uh, the state zero, but it will turn state one into a negative one. Um, these are probably the prime examples of uh, logic gates acting on a single qubit. We do have requirements. We can't just say that any uh, two by two matrix uh, is going to be a valid quantum gate. We require that the two by two matrix or any quantum gate is actually unitary. This just means that it's uh, when I take the conjugate transpose and multiply it or apply it to the uh, um, original gate U, I get the identity back. Conjugate transpose just have a little example here. That's where the dagger notation comes in. This just means the conjugate tra conjugate transpose of U. So I take the transpose of all my elements in my matrix, which in this case is just negative one. I'm sorry, negative i and 1, and then I transpose it. Easy enough. And u is going to be unitary if the product of u dagger and u is i. Okay, so if you go back to our uh, logic gates here, it's not very difficult to find uh, the uh, um, 
to kind of get transposed because we're only dealing with real numbers. Um, but you can work it out yourself. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to show that these are all indeed unitary. And so they all are uh, valid quantum gates. And this is actually the only restriction we have on our, on our uh, quantum gate. If it is unitary, it is a valid quantum gate. Brings us to uh, a total gate. Um, hopefully, I'm not butchering that pronunciation. Hopefully, uh, really, it's good. Uh, really, what we're doing, um, we're given as input states A, B, and C, and we're looking at a conditional not gate here. So, a conditional not gate. We're really just focusing on well, are these two bits on, or are they one? If so, we're going to apply this not gate. Um, we'll go through a couple examples, uh, but what's lovely about this Toffoli gate is that it is reversible, so we can use it as a uh, possible quantum gate. There is one in particular that we want to focus at. This is on. Um, this is a uh, classical NAND gate. I know that it looks kind of funky with this slide. This is a classical operation that's not reversible. Um, so what it's doing, and this, I should probably explain this product here more. This is just the AND operation. That works well for this because we're using binary. So if you can think of it as multiplication, that's fine. Uh, so A and AND B is going to consider, well, are they both on? Are they both one? If so, we're going to uh, negate it. If this is zero in the middle, we're going to turn it one. So I made a couple parameters for A and B. Um, there's two different cases, a can equal 0, b can equal 1. Well, that will give us a and b is equal to 1. Same thing for when a is equal to 0 and b is equal to 0. The NAND will give us 1 once again. So we can't reverse it because, well, 1 will give us two different, actually three in this case, we can do 1, 0, three different cases where uh, the output will be 1. So this is not going to be reversible. But we can use a Toffoli gate to construct a reversible uh, NAND gate. Um, it'll just involve a few extra bits. So we just require that our state here is uh, um, always set at 1, always set to on. And this will give us the NAND operation and just output the original 2 to be given. So it's kind of a cool little thing. If you have a phone on you, you can do this along with me. Um, it's kind of a fun little tool if you're using uh, quantum gates. We actually use this in the uh, cryptographer's summer camp that the professors here um, put on. So this just allows us to kind of manipulate some gates in a way. Uh, as you can see here, I have my uh, Toffoli gate um, that I just used previously. I'm just going to go back to that slide. And you're allowed to kind of mess around with it to see like, uh, well, uh, what's going to happen if I uh, place a Hadamard gate um, in front of it. Well, remember that Hadamard gate, it, it will put, uh, I'm going to set this to, it will put our bit into superposition. So there's going to be half a probability of it being one, half a probability of it being zero. And that's why it really changes our states here when we look at uh, the total gate. Well, half chance this is one. If it is, this uh, conditional not is going to go through. And we'll end up with a zero here. If it is off, we won't supply the uh, conditional um, not, and we'll end up with a one. So these have to be reversible. Can anyone think what the reverse would be? Maybe it's obvious. Of, a, of this uh, NAND gate. I want it to be reversible, so I should be able to apply another gate and get back to what I originally started with. So? Yeah, it's just going to be itself, actually. Um, so you can just add these conditionals. Okay. You can see it'll just be the inverse of itself. So kind of a fun little tool, especially if you're just beginning with uh, 
I guess, uh, quantum computation. Uh, it's called Quark. Um, it's very nice. Uh, um, a bunch of high schoolers learning how to do it, so it must be fairly intuitive. They're very bright, too, I guess. So. Um, Okay, so that uh, finishes what I want to discuss a little bit about the introduction to quantum computation. Um, I want to go back to now the security requirements for NIST. And we're going to analyze a, a bit of uh, where they come up with some of these parameters uh, given that we're going to apply a certain attack to one of these encryption schemes. The ones in particular that I'm going to be considering are going to be the uh, New Hope and Frodo. These are two lattice-based schemes. Um, so, sorry engineers, no isogenies today. Uh, but you will learn a little bit about lattices, so just I'll give you just a brief introduction. I know a lot of people have seen this already. Uh, uh, lattice is just a discrete subspace of R, so if you take any open neighborhood around any points, it'll just be just any input. There is a neighborhood where that point is all alone. And it's just going to be linear combinations of a uh, basis of Rn that are that have coefficients from the integers. Um, it'll be a little more clear when I look at an example. Um, typically, uh, at least for this lecture, I'll describe them um, using column notation for lattices. So if you see a lattice of this form, just know that B1, B2, these are columns of the lattice, and these are my uh, lattice basis. So these will generate my lattice. Just kind of a quick example. Um, let's say I have a, a lattice of ring three. I have three columns that are my basis vectors. Um, and these are just my three ways of representing them. I just use the integer uh, notation here to mean I can replace any integer there and get a lattice point. Okay. If you look at more of a two-dimensional uh, aerial view of the lattice, um, this is a lattice generated by uh, 4, 3, and 3, 1. Um, so you can see where all these points come from. I'm just adding and subtracting these two vectors together. So if I wanted to arrive at this point, I just take B1 and then subtract B2 from it. If I wanted to arrive at this point, I just take negative B2 and so on. It's just how I generate my lattice. Of course, the lattices in practice will be much larger and much more complicated than two and three dimensions. Probably the most famous lattice problem is going to be the shortest vector problem. Okay. And it's exactly what it sounds like. So given a lattice, I need to find the smallest, the shortest. Uh, and when I say shortest, I just mean the L2 norm. Uh, it's just the distance from zero that that lattice point is. So if I was looking at the previous example, um, where my lattice is generated by these three column vectors. The shortest vector is going to be this linear combination of the uh, basis elements. So when we solve the shortest vector problem, we have found the smallest or shortest uh, lattice point. There's two different ways we can do this. Well, there's also a combinatorial attacks, but uh, the two I will discuss, and I'll mainly, mainly focus on the first one, which is Seven. These are two uh, ways that we can solve the shortest vector problem of lattices, um, sieving and enumeration. So both of these can actually be sped up by a quantum computer. Uh, it's actually where the estimates for security will come from when we're considering the quantum sieve. Uh, You'll notice that asymptotically, this seeding uh, algorithm looks better, right? It's only uh, exponential instead of super exponential. Um, however, for 
values of smaller n. So if we're looking at smaller dimensional lattices, it might be the case a lot where enumeration is faster. It all depends on the constant in front of the n in the big O notation, uh, which one is uh, preferable. Okay. Uh, the main algorithm used in uh, lattice attacks is this BKZ algorithm. And what it does is it, uh, when it's called on the entire lattice, it focuses on smaller, um, smaller dimensional sub-lattices. So in this case, I saw I presented this way at a talk. That's why I, I uh, have seven here. I'm not referring to the block size seven. Here we're actually going to be using block size five. Okay. So you can see here, I, I, right now I have a lattice of dimension 10. Well, what I call a BKZ algorithm on it. This is going to give me shorter, more orthogonal vectors. I focus on the first five basis elements in the lattice generated by them. I find the shortest vector, and I put it there. And then I move on to the next block. I call my shortest vector problem solver, find the shortest vector, put it where B2 is, and then so on and so on. And when I finally reach the end, this is called one BKZ tour. Okay. And we can do this multiple, multiple times until we get uh, a lattice satisfying the condition we want. Um, hopefully where the shortest vector is going to be placed at B1. So this is the main algorithm used when uh, considering uh, lattice attacks on each crypto systems. So naturally you want to look at, well, how expensive is this going, is this attack going to be? The entire algorithm is going to be dominated by that small uh, shortest vector problem solver. So when we're focusing on a smaller dimensional lattice instead of the big picture. So we actually want to look at the uh, complexity of a shortest vector problem solver instead of BKZ as a whole. So one of them that I mentioned was a sieving algorithm for solving shortest vector problem. Um, like I said, they were exponential, but they give us a good lower bound starting point to uh, these security requirements. So we can see that a lower bound for an attack cost is going to be whatever that block size necessary is, so the dimension of the lattice we're looking at in each sub-lattice routine, times some constant as the exponent of two is going to be our uh, computational cost. Um, so, there are a couple different seeding algorithms I need to discuss. First, the classical seeding algorithm. Uh, this constant here is going to be a 0.292. So, when we're considering classical tax, we consider when this C here, the constant in the big O notation is 0.292. Um, and then there's two quantum cases, and I separate them uh, uh, because in, in theory, the second one for the 0.265, this is the best known attack against a quantum, or with a quantum computer against SVP. However, uh, this attack requires a uh, storage cost of 2 to the CB, where C is actually this 0.2075. So no matter what, sieving algorithms are going to have to store a certain amount of vectors, um, and that's that storage requirement is what is represented here by that worst case quantum. Okay, so at, at so no matter how fast an algorithm we run for seeding, we're still going to have to worry about storing two to the c beta vectors, where this is our c value. So it's still quite a lot to think. Of. That's why I consider a worst case quantum. Um, okay. And just the log two cost is mostly what we represent. For, or, uh, how we represent our security parameters. So the attack that I consider uh, on the encryption schemes that are based on um, lattice problems would be a, called what's known as a primal attack. I won't go into depth for this one because it gets fairly complicated, but the idea is it, it takes the underlying problem that New Hope and Fred are based on, so while well, the underlying problem of psych would be the SIDH, 
underlying, underlying problem of New Hope and Frodo are uh, respectively ring learning with theirs and learning with theirs. Frodo did something fun with that. They, they want to get rid of the ring, so they just call themselves. Yeah, Lord of the Rings reference. But uh, so really, the, the two problems are up both reduce to a SVP problem for lattices. That's what the primal attack does. It takes that underlying problem and converts it to um, a lattice problem. There are multiple methods to find what block size needed, uh, what block size is needed to uh, solve the instance using that BKZ algorithm. Um, they'll be in the references, but I, I did it by myself to just find the betas. Um, Necessary. So to launch this, launch a successful. Is that yellow? Show up, okay. Good. Um, so to launch a successful attack on New Hope 512, the block size needed in the algorithm is going to be 386, which means we look at a lattice of dimension 386. Um, and Frodo 976. Given that the pre the sorry the parameters of that encryption scheme, the beta necessary to solve that instance is going to be 707, and that's going to be the size of the lattice that we consider. And again, we have just the classical worst case and quantum uh, cost listed here. There's actually some great resources. I'm really utilizing this QR code thing today. Um, but, oops. It's not letting me copy that. There's a really nice resource when you're looking at uh, the cost of um, the attacks on the entry and LWE schemes, so the lattice schemes. I just want to show you that clip. Here it is. <clears throat> this is done by Martin Albrecht. Um, it's all, uh, it, it really is useful if you're trying to understand what attacks you're looking for. Um, so if we just want to compare with what we got, uh, we can just find New Hope, for example. And we'll describe our attack type. Um, we were looking at the primal. Okay, so this here represents the uh, quantum cost, not the worst case, and this is the classical. Uh, so we should have a classical cost of New Hope for 113. And oh, sorry. And 259 for the quantum. Oops. I mess it up somehow. 113 for classical and quantum cost of uh, 103. Yeah. It's kind of a useful tool if you want. You can uh, check out all the lattice based schemes here. Um, these are. This is why lattice based cryptography is, I guess, uh, very difficult right now to actually establish good security requirements. These are all the proposed cost models. So there's quite a lot to deal with. And they're all just given different cost models if we're looking at vector, uh, sorry, uh, vector addition uh, for Frodo, for example. Frodo <clears throat> thinks we should consider something like this, for example, where there's just that extra uh, plus beta the exponent. So this is a kind of a useful tool um, you can use, and kept it kind of brief today. Hope that's okay. Um, but here are my references. I have to answer any questions. So the questions. Any questions? I have a question uh, just about this last thing because so uh, the 512 parameters are, are claiming uh, security level one, but uh, th that's below level one, right? So what is the matter here? 
or a man missing something, a new hope five, five twelve should be category one. Oh, it's your. It should yeah. be 128. Uh, the quantum wire. Or even a classical is under 128. Right, so classical is under 128. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I agree. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> okay, yes, so they yes, have no yeah. capacity? Or? So, what happened on here? Maybe I got it wrong. I thought I got it. No, so we no, I think that's all right. That's, 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 that's oh, okay. Well, yeah, for classical it would be uh, 113. Yeah, that's really not good enough. But <laughs> okay, but maybe this depends, maybe you can comment on why, because uh, for New Hope it has to be a power of two, so maybe they're, they're constrained uh -huh. by that. Uh, well, that doesn't really give any good. <coughs> you want me to explain why New Hope has to be power? Yeah, I mean. Uh, oh, why you can't do something in the middle? Yeah, yeah because uh, well, New Hope is uh, is a ring over a cyclotomic uh, field, um, x to some power of two plus one. Uh, it's just I think they get a lot of useful properties from cyclotomic field extensions from there, um, and. Just from having uh, their cyclotomic number field over two to the n plus one, right? Um, so yeah, I guess New Hope in order to establish a secure ring learning with their um, assumption, they always need to be over that ring. So they really don't have many choices. They have 512, 1024, and then 2048. Can't really <laughs> do anything in between, yeah. Yeah, no other questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah. Um can you go back to the BKZ algorithm? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so um maybe I'm not completely understanding it, but to me it sort of looks like the sorting algorithm. Is that what it is? Um, no, nothing's, I guess the, the sorting comes in, uh, we go through a process called size reduction, but really we're just finding that we're not moving any of these vectors around until we replace V1 with the shortest vector. Um, that's really the I can't really think of the any sorting that goes around besides that. But yeah, we're really just looking through this lattice, finding a short vector, then that's what we replace v1 by, if that makes sense. And then we move on to the next. And then, um, just on a different slide in that last slide that you're at, when you mentioned the worst case, those numbers are smaller. I guess I'm confused what you're referring to as mm -hmm. a worst yeah, case. Yeah, so when I look yeah. at quantum cost, I look for a lower bound of just like the the time complexity of it would be um, 0 0.265 times the dimension of your um, uh, of your lattice, okay. and the worst case would be to uh, sorry 0 0.75 times n. This one is going to be the resource requirement unit. So both of these are sieving algorithms. This is going to be the uh, time complexity used to solve one of these instances. This is going to be the number of vectors that you need to store to actually successfully launch a seed attack. So we assume that, well, maybe this, this might get better, you know, like, well, how good can this actually get? Let's just assume it gets as good as it can possibly be. Let's pick up this one instead, because we know no matter what, they're going to have to store this information. And that's exponential, so we can't allow that. Does that make sense? Not really, but I Well, sorry, there's, there's a difference between like the resources you need and also the, the I guess, uh, time it's going to take to run through the CPU number. So those two things represent Two things for because I guess I'm just confused because yeah, you can say there's two different algorithms. You were referencing one as the time and one as the memory. I guess the algorithmic complexity is that would that be better? Like I'm looking at the algorithms used in this one, okay. not the storage requirements. 
this is the storage requirement for the CU. Okay. So no matter so. what, I can I can run this, and I know like maybe this this is going to be fast enough, but I can make this as fast as I want. If I adopt this one as my worst case, I know no matter what, no matter how fast that calculation gets, I'm still going to have to store these. I'll, Sorry, I'll have to think about it more, I guess. It still doesn't make sense to me, but that's fine. It's just me. Okay. Sorry. I don't know if I no, 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 yeah, it's fine. Uh, explain it correctly. Yeah. I, I mean, for, it, uh, for an explanation for this, the difference of these two numbers, uh, 0 0.265 comes from, uh, I mean, obtained by a uh, random walk uh, algorithm using the quantum computers, am I right? Do you know the... No, I think the 0 0.2075 algorithm uh, of memory requirement comes from some no, no, no. geometric... The time, co the time computer is 0 0.265 times something. Uh, is it because of the uh, using a random walk algorithm? Uh, I think from what Sean described, this is a memory heavy algorithm, so that's not a random. No, but he's asking like where this complexity comes from. Where the two six five zero point two six five? Where does that? Come? From the sieving algorithm. Sieving By combining the vectors, I guess, right? So we have lots of vectors, and we combine them like more combinatorial way, but uh, together with some geometric information. Every time we try to reduce it. So I think what Sean said uh, is correct. So uh, for the memory requirement, there are some arguments saying that without such many vectors, there's no way to find the shortest vector. That's why it's a memory requirement. Mm -hmm. Seems to be the minimum, minimum of one if we stick to this algorithm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got this point. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> More questions? Comments? Do you know if this entropy paper uh, estimate in entropy paper has an uh, estimate for the quantum elimination algorithm? I only saw the seeding. So they only put the quantum seeding over there. Right. And they actually don't consider the worst case scenario okay. also on the website. I don't. Okay. I don't know if that's necessary or not. But okay. yeah. So, so these complexities are for random lattices or? I think they would be for random lattices. You must assume that your okay. cryptographic, cryptographic instance looks random. Uh, Are they for random lattices or for or any 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 assumptions about the lattices? Uh, there is no assumption about the lattice. Just random ones uh, it should be should work for Well, we make assumptions on the lattice stru structure for these attacks, but not for the complexity arguments. Is, it, is there anything known for cases where you you can make assumptions about the lattices and improve the, uh, the complexity? Um, I mean, improve, reduce the complexity. Yeah, I guess if, like, for example, we're given an instance of LWE, we know that the lattice isn't going to be is it going to have a shortest vector that's typical? If we reduce it from LWE to USVP, it's actually going to be a lot smaller. So that changes our ability to actually find that smallest vector. We might not have to use, um, I guess, as strong as an algorithm to find it. But so in that case, I think it's we really need to be careful on what kind of lattice we're working with, just when we're establishing the beta because then we can make assumptions about our lattice. But I think in the complexity arguments, they just take any um, n-dimensional lattice. So this is the equivalent of, say, ISD, where you put just like a generic attack on a random instance, essentially. Yeah, I think they are the quick matter yeah. OK. Any more questions? So I have a question about Entru. So Entru, in the, the first uh, the first versions of Entru, had uh, some symmetry, right? I mean, 
there, yeah. there was a uh, symmetry in the base, right? That would reduce the complexity. Well, what's the current situation with them too? I mean, what's the latest? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I guess we, uh, do we have, Sean, do you know if we have the N2 estimate on the, of course, uh, there should be a fee on the paper, right, by Martin. Right. Maybe we can just go over the security of this N2. Yeah. You wanted this website? Yeah. yeah. Just, just think that. I don't think there is an attack. Uh, using the symmetry, we can improve a factor of other n, where n is dimensional like this. That's the best we can do. There's a polynomial improvement. There's no exponential improvement using the structure. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a good question, because I think that's what topic people try to understand how to use the structure. There's also a notion that n is true in the beginning, in the first row, not uh, about this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So maybe that refers to N2 HRSS. Yeah, I'm not sure. I only briefly looked at it for the new hope parameters, but okay. I'm not sure. Now. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm not up to date on intro. Perhaps I should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, if any more questions, so no more questions. Uh, let's start showing it. Uh, so yes, yeah, so thanks, Sean. And uh, we can stay and discuss a couple of things. I think to clarify, I will stop this. <laughs>